Greetings, great people, oh great Abyssinian people. Today we are going to talk about Rastafari. Who is Rastafari and what is the origin of their diet and their dreadlocks? To get a proper understanding of Rastafari, we should overstand that Rasta did not fall from the sky. It is not an independent movement. It has roots, and the roots of Rastafari lies deep within its predecessor, the Nyabingi Arda. So, who is Rastafari? Well, since the 1930s, and for approximately the next 50 years, that answer was easy. We knew simply by looking at them. Rastas did not comb their hair or cut it. Neither did they shave their beards or moustache. They look opposite to the oppressor. Their clothes was also different. Theirs usually had a flag or an Ethiopian pin are decorated with the colors of red, gold, green, and black. It could also have the image of Emperor Selassie, Marcus Gavi, a lion, the map of Africa, or even the face of another African liberator imprinted somewhere. Rastas did not eat meat. They believe in life, so they let the animals live. Furthermore, the biggest animals in the world maintain a plant-based diet. As such, Rasta know that eating meat is not necessary to live a healthy life. And today's dietitians are proving them right. In those early days, they were known as laxmen and they were persecuted on sight by the police who were mostly white. As a result, only people serious about Rastafari would wear their hair in dreadlocks or even grow a beard. The presence of Rasta was an immediate and constant, constant reminder to the people that there was something else. Something they didn't fully understand. Rastafari came into being in Jamaica as a result of the coronation of Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia on November 2nd, 1930. And it blossomed considerably all over the world when the Emperor visited Jamaica on April 21st, 1966. So, let's get into this and look at a few people and some events in more detail. We have a look at people like Queen Ayabingi, Marcus Gavi, Emperor Haile Selassie, Leonard Howell, Robert Hines, Joseph Hibbert, Henry Dunkley, Claudius Henry, Prophet Gad, Prince Emmanuel, and a few others. Now, to start, Kogoga, Kenya. In Kenya, we find a group of freedom fighters led by a woman named Queen Nyabingi. Naya means black and Bingi means victory. Now, during the liberation struggle in Africa, we fight and resist every day and every night. And Queen Naya Bingi led a group of warriors who didn't comb their hair or shave their beards. Subsequently, subsequently, their thick and comb locks and beard make them look dread. And this caused them to be later known as dreadlocks. Due to the leadership of Queen Nyabingi, the enslavers suffered many personal losses. Her group attacked hunting parties on their way. She attacked the dungeons and also the forts and other strongholds that protected these dungeons. She attacked all of them and unfortunately some of her fighters were captured and taken to Jamaica to be enslaved and we resisted all the way. Now, after landing in Jamaica in 1563, this new generation emerged from the backbone of their fathers and adopted the mentality of their mothers. They took on the name, the look and the activities of the Kenyan Dreadlocks Liberator and the Nyabingi Freedom Fighter was born again in Jamaica. 
this dreadlocks group was comprised of both genders and was primarily responsible for the physical destruction of the oppressor and the slave making operations. Them burned crops, machinery, equipment, factory, warehouse, vehicle, the big house, and any other infrastructure that supported our enslavement. The Nyabinge was our defense department. So, for approximately the next 200 years, the Nyabinge put on a program of continuous assault on plantations everywhere across the island. The British eventually signed a peace treaty with another rebellious group called the Maroons in 1738, hoping to reduce the attack on their plantations. However, the dreadlocks Nyabinge refused to sign anything with the oppressor. They knew that the oppressor could not be trusted. Now, in the late 1700s to the early 1800s, some of those who were somewhat domesticated, they began to realize that the slave master's children were just as bad as their fathers. As such, they became frustrated. And leaders of these movements would sometimes resort to the ways of the Nyabinge by burning plantations and business places of the slave master's children, even killing them. Now, in 1760, Taki led one of those massive rebellions across the island. They took over plantations and killed the white plantation owners. Taki's rebellion, like many other rebellions to come, was dealt with mercilessly by colonial officials. These rebellions were always very successful and it took them months to re-establish order, do repairs and replace buildings and machinery. Another frustrated one was Sam Sharp. He previously used organized strike and other forms of protest, but eventually he led one of the biggest rebellions in 1831 all across the island, and that also contributed to abolition. He was also killed by the British in 1832, one year before slavery officially ended. But before he was killed, he placed his nail in the coffin of Europe. Anyway, the dreadlocks Nyabingi, who was never domesticated, made sure the kidnappers from Europe paid a heavy price on a regular basis for enslaving us. They were a formidable and effective liberation unit, and their many victories caused England to eventually lose direct power in Jamaica, and this was manifested by abolition, which came in 1833. So, as a result of abolition and the signing of documents and treaties with England by local leaders, the Nyabingi warriors were deemed to be not needed anymore, or so they thought. Anyway, the Nyabingi decided to work with local leaders and lay down their arms. However, they still kept one eye on the European oppressor. They knew he was a genetic deceiver. So, from 1833, there was a reduction in the number of plantations that were destroyed. There was also a serious decline in the number of kidnappers who were killed. In all of this, there were others within the Nyabingi who didn't want to lay down arms. They didn't trust the white man. They knew he was a fraud. However, freedom was in the air, and since we are a peaceful people, we lay down our arms, hoping to live a normal life and rebuild our society. We soon found out that the words of the European was worthless. It was full of deceit. We found out that these terrorists only modified themselves at abolition. We were still captives, and among other things, we couldn't leave the island without their permission. By the time certain things was realized, dreadlocks people had already laid down their arms. 
They were not out burning plantations and killing the oppressor anymore. They were now farming and teaching and building and constructing and making things and cooking and doing other community functions. They hadn't lost the fire for liberation. However, the methods now used were different from those of their ancestors. The children of the Nyabingi and their supporters, they now had a new role, an academic role, a role of non-violence. And this non-violence role started in 1833 at abolition. Now, even after abolition, the oppressive system still produced aggravation, especially for our people who had believed in it. And because they had adopted the authority and the order of the kidnapper, they used his means to show their displeasure. They would demonstrate or go on strike, all to no avail. Eventually, another man named Paul Bogle led a huge rebellion in 1865. He was also later killed by the British approximately 35 years after slavery ended. So, from 1833 at abolition, the Nyabingi transformed itself when some members left the hills and moved back into the community or rejoined their families. They, however, remained skeptical. They kept their dreadlocks and beard and began teaching about Africa, reparations and repatriation. In response, the mostly white police and their media portrayed dreadlocks people as crooks and vagrants and many Jamaicans started to believe this to be so. As such, they acted negatively based on what they heard from the slave master and not from what they knew, since these dreadlocks were their neighbors, they were their family members, even their children. This new generation thought the war was over. They were domesticated by the enemy and soon some became convinced that people with dreadlocks were outcasts and lawbreakers and people who didn't belong in the society. The invader built schools and churches for our new generations and began further indoctrination. As a result, some of us accepted the European way of life, including his white god, and would ask the dreadlocks in their community, where is your god? It was a good question. You see, even though times had changed, people with dreadlocks did not. They did not give up on Africa, and they still rejected the god of the white man, even though they could not identify one for themselves at the time. And this was a problem because those asking the question were expecting an answer that was relative to their adopted religious situation. The Nyabingi was wrapped up fighting for physical liberation for centuries. So their children were not prepared with a theological answer even though, even though we had maintained our spirituality. We were starting over in a new place, and the only records we had to go by was what made itself obvious through our genetic thoughts and behaviors. However, regardless of how little we knew, that little included the fact that the white man was not our God. So for nine decades, from 1833 at abolition to 1930, and 1930 is a very important year, those who became domesticated and accepted the white god of Europe would often mock and jeer people with dreadlocks, saying they did not have a god. But the people with dreadlocks, thankfully, never wavered. They remained steadfast in their behaviors and teachings, knowing that they were right, knowing that the information they are producing is coming from their genetic order. Well, Jamaica produced a giant named Marcus Giave. And in 1916, Giavi and his wife, Amy, founded and led an organization known as the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA. 
Gabby went to America and through the UNIA he taught self-help programs and demanded reparations and repatriation to Africa. As a result, he was constantly monitored by US authorities. Gabby was eventually arrested and convicted of mail fraud in the amount of $25. Can you imagine that? A man who by three ships established many businesses and charities. How can a man like that steal $25? To do what? Gabby was convicted as expected, however, and he became Jamaica's first deportee in 1928. Now, earlier in 1922, Gavi talked about the need for black people having their own God instead of worshipping the God of our enemy, the God of those who enslaved us. He said the Chinese have a Chinese God, the Indians have an Indian God, white people have a white God, so we should have a black God. Now, that analogy sounds very reasonable and was accepted by plenty of people. So the question now is, where do they go from here? What do they do with this information, with this new way of thinking? Now, in 1929, Gavi provided even more details and tell his listeners they should look to Africa where a black king descended from the lineage of David shall be crowned and he shall be your redeemer. Well, this statement became the foundation of the Rastafari movement. At the turn of the century, things took a giant leap in 1930. 1930, when Rastafari Makonnen was coronated in Ethiopia. He was crowned Emperor Haile Selassie I. And this African coronation was a blessing for people with dreadlocks and the liberation movement as it presented the emperor as a godlike figure. Some even say as God himself. Now, because the emperor was projected as a god, his value cannot be overstated. His value cannot be overemphasized. As a black god, he became an option to the white god who was the only god in town. Before the emperor was presented as a god, the thought about another god was the furthest thing from the mentality of those who were religiously domesticated by the enslaver for over 400 years. And even though some did not completely believe in this new god from Ethiopia, the thought, the thought tickled their brains. In addition, further thoughts began to appear in the minds of those sitting on the fence. They didn't really believe in the white god of Europe, but with no option and lots of fear, they didn't drift too far from that either. So for them, the emperor was a mind opener to other god possibilities, even if they didn't believe that the emperor was a god. This coronation was a blessing. The coronation of Emperor Selassie and his wife, Empress Menin, took place in Addis Ababa on November 2nd, 1930. It was an unusual and glorious event. He was 225th in the royal dynasty of Ethiopia and ordained with various titles like King of Kings, Power of the Trinity, the Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah and many more. The coronation is reenacted every year at the Nyabingi Center at Scotts Pass in Clarendon, Jamaica, and all over the world. Now, some said this coronation was divine, and that Selassie must be the god and king Marcus Gavi prophesied about, since his lineage was so impressive. He is also descended from the dynasty of Menelik I, who was born of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Selassie's supporters would later conclude that he was the earthly manifestation of God, that his birth was foretold in the Bible, and his lineage goes back several centuries, even before the birth of Christ. Now, we must keep in mind 
that up to 1930 there was no Rasta in Jamaica however there were people who were dreadlocks and these were the militant descendants of the Nyabingi and of their supporters who had maintained that persona and characteristics and these people kept their distance from the slave master even after abolition and continued a life of separation most of these people resided in the hills and in the mountains of Jamaica so now that a black king was crowned in Africa, one can imagine how powerful people like Leonard Howell felt. So who is Leonard Howell? Leonard Howell was born in Clarendon, Jamaica on June 16, 1898. And like many others, he was taken to America by his parents. In America, he joined Marcus Garvey and the UNIA, and as a result, he too was also deported in 1932. As a revolutionary freedom fighter in America, Howell was frustrated at our living conditions under white supremacy and wanted to end their control over Africa and the minds of the African people. He was also a farmer. So, upon his return to Jamaica, he acquired a few acres and started his farming project. It soon was obvious that only people with dreadlocks was working on his farm. Even though Howell had no dreadlocks, they had many other things in common. Number one, this group had already rejected white society. They loved the land and was very passionate about Africa. It was no coincidence, this group of people with dreadlocks, they were the children of the Nyabingi and their supporters. Howell soon realized he was very fortunate to have this powerful workforce ready and waiting. He acquired more land and planted a wide variety of grown provisions, including ganja. Now, those people with dreadlocks, who were attracted to Howell were generally the offsprings of retired Nyabingi fighters and those who came into a knowledge of self. And these were the most fearless ones among us. These had no reservation identifying themselves through their locks. Locks that were a magnet for persecution from the police, many of whom came directly from England. So, for those without locks, who say they are Rasta in their heart and serious about it too. Good for you. At least you won't be identified, humiliated, abused or even killed by the police. Because your locks cannot be seen, you will escape the persecution. The persecution that come just, just for having the locks. The persecution others are willing to bear and even defend with their lives. Now, Hoyle had witnessed the Ethiopian coronation of Emperor Haile Selassie I while in America. And he saw many leaders in attendance. One of those in attendance was the son of George V, King of England. And he brought gifts and bowed before Selassie I. Howell concluded that this man must be the redeemer Gavi prophesied about. Howell then saw Selassie I as the great black messiah and began distributing pictures of the emperor. He established the King of Kings mission and urged the people to worship Selassie as their god and king. He appointed himself as Selassie's representative in Jamaica and wrote his revolutionary book of resistance, The Promised Key. Now, the colonial state soon realized that this God option presented by Howell was a very serious threat to their control over the minds of the people, especially the young people, and they would have none of it. So Howell and his followers were made to live a life of hell for daring to resist British order and as a result he was imprisoned many times.
However, Selassie's coronation had given Howell renewed strength, and in 1935, his farming project took him to a 500-acre property in Sligoville, St. Catherine, called Pinnacle. It was also a place of worship. From Pinnacle, he increased in farming production and used the funds to expand his African liberation program. At Pinnacle, he established a school, a bakery, drilled a number of wells, sold surplus crops. So subsequently, the Rasta residents became self-sufficient and they were able to take care of their needs. Now, because Pinnacle was financially independent, this did not sit well with the British who didn't want the idea of unity and self-employment to circulate among those ordinary people who they are domesticated. In addition, Howell was always teaching about Africa, reparations, repatriation and the brutality of our enslavement. Howell thought that the Lion of Judah had broken the chain and we, the black race, are finally free. Howell said, George V is no longer our king. And he reminded them, he reminded the people that George V sent his son to bow down to our new king, which is Rastafari in Ethiopia. Now, that and other statements led to Howell getting charged with sedition. He was put on trial on March 13, 1934, and them sentenced him to two years in prison. Upon his release, him stepped up in preaching on Selassie, and this earned him a huge following. Now, Rasta live all over Jamaica in a communities like Bakawal in Kingston, and that Bakawal community was destroyed by Edward Siaga, more upon him later, to create his political garrison called Tivoli Gardens. You'd have had a Rasta camp existing in Scotts Pass, Sandy Bay, and Freetown in Clarendon. You'd have camps in St. Thomas in Westmoreland, all over the island. However, Pinnacle was the largest camp. It was a shining light. Now, beginning in January 1941, the British governor realized the positive effects Pinnacle was having on the community as many British farmers start to lose workers. These workers began working for themselves or they went to work at Pinnacle. So, as a result, the governor raided Pinnacle. It was a matter of policy. And in every raid, the police would seize thousands of pounds, which was a fortune in those days, claiming it was the proceeds of ganja sales. Rastafari was generally abused all over the land for the slightest reasons. If a man with a beard committed a crime, it was blame on Rasta. And in 1954, the colonial state launched a final major offensive against Rastafari at Pinnacle. Them destroy crop, stock, machinery, burn down the buildings, arrest all who they could capture, some barely escape. They were beaten, kept in jail for months. Rasta was a challenge to the colonial political order. And by 1958, the prosperous Rasta community of Pinnacle was no more. Leonard Howell died in Jamaica on February 25, 1981, as an unknown soldier. His death was overshadowed by the 1980 general elections, which were very violent. Over 1,500 people were killed. This 1980 general election was rigged by America to make sure the knowledge from the Nyabingi, which is self-awareness, and that was gained during the 60s and 70s, would not continue. They removed Michael Manley as Prime Minister and installed a white American named Edward Siaga. Siaga was brought onto the political scene by a man named Alexander Bustamante. More on him later. Michael Manley displayed a certain amount of respect for Rastafari 
and in a 1979 at every political rally where him go he produced a walking stick where him call the rod of correction him say him get it from emperor haile selassie to deal with siaga however him lose that election and some say it's because he never get that rod from the emperor <laughs> So, since 1980, a new violent political period begin, and this new violence completely overshadow the passing of Howell, causing his memory and that of other revolutionaries to be temporarily suspended from the minds of the people. Siaga, in the meantime, established the biggest gang in Jamaica called the Showa Posse and he uses political influence to prevent the security forces from entering Tivoli Gardens. Another freedom fighter was Robert Hines and he spent many many years working with Leonard Oil. He was also arrested, jailed and sent to the Maddows on many many occasions. We also have Joseph Hibbert and after the coronation of the emperor, Hibbert was one of the first preachers of the Rastafari movement in Jamaica. Hibbert, he worked in Costa Rica for about 20 years and he became a member of the ancient order of the Ethiopia Masonic Lodge. Hibbert returned to Jamaica in 1931 and started a ministry called the Ethiopian Coptic Fit in St. Andrew. He said that after studying the Ethiopic translation of the Bible, he concluded that Haile Selassie is divine. Sometime later, he transferred his ministry to Kingston, where he came across a street preacher named Leonard Howell, who was teaching a similar doctrine. And like Howell, Hebert was arrested and imprisoned many times by the white authorities. Another pioneer of the Rastafari movement was Henry Dunkley. Now, after the coronation of the emperor, Dunkley, who was employed by the United Fruit Company, he returned to Port Antonio, Jamaica in 1930 and he became a street preacher. He revealed that his studies of the Bible convinced him that the newly crowned Haile Selassie was the return messiah and that Rastafari was his name. In 1933, Dunkley went to Kingston and he founded the King of Kings Ethiopian Mission. Dunkley, like Hibbert, Howell and Hines, they were arrested and imprisoned by the white authorities repeatedly on various charges like disorderly conduct, lightering and sedition. In August 1938, Dunkley became a foundation member of the first Jamaican local chapter of the Ethiopian World Federation. In 1957, another returning resident arrived from New York named Claudius Henry. He was not your everyday returnee. He approached the Rastafarian movement from a more militant point of view, a more Nyabingi point of view. Henry, he praised the emperor and he spoke of reparation and repatriation. He also formed the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Henry turned his church at Sandy Bay in Clarendon into a religious and entrepreneurial center with a black making factory, a farm, and a bakery. And from a personal point of view, in bread, donuts, and other naturally baked goods was the best products sold in Mapen. Now, Henry's group was linked with the first Africa Corps, which is a black militant group from New York who had a guerrilla training camp in Red Hills. And in 1959, the police claim they have information that Henry was planning to overthrow the government of Jamaica. So, they raid the house in Kingston, raid the church at Sandy Bay in a Clarendon, and raid the bakery in a Mapen. Them claim to find gun, ammunition, and a letter to Fidel Castro asking for help to overthrow the Jamaican government. 
Henry and his wife was arrested and charged for treason against the Jamaican colonial government and he was sentenced to seven years. She was sentenced to two years. As a result, Henry's son Ronald took over the movement with the intention of releasing his father from prison as the first call to order. At some point, three police informers who had infiltrated the movement were identified and killed and this led to a violent confrontation with the police. During the shootout, two British police were killed and two injured. Ronald and two others were later hunted, arrested and hanged for those deaths. Now, although the above men never wear the customary locks and other outward symbols of Rastafari, their roots and revolutionary activities are firmly entwined within the history and the workings of Rastafari.